Can you tell us a little bit about what we've learned in rapamycin as we've pivoted, pivoted to companion animals? So when we talk specifically about cats and dogs, so what is it about cats and dogs that are interesting? Well, first of all, they're a heck of a lot closer to humans than, than mice are, but they're also not genetically inbred the way mice are. They live in our environment, not a sterile environment. Uh, they consume, you know, food that probably looks a little bit more uh, like the food we would consume, at least in some cases. Um, so, so, so tell us about what you've learned in this study, which has really occupied uh, more than a decade of, of, your, of your research. Right. Yeah. So there's two other things I would add about companion animals and and dogs in particular where my most of my work has been but but this is also true for for cats um, one is they age more rapidly than people do right so that's super important because then that, that means we can actually measure outcomes of interest in the time frame that's compatible with a with a clinical trial um, secondly they matter right more than 50% of people say that their pet is part of their family. So there's sort of an intrinsic value, I believe, in developing therapies that can improve health span and, and longevity of companion animals from, from that perspective. So just to make sure, yeah, what you're basically saying is, even if we learned nothing about the longevity of humans, this would be a worthwhile pursuit in the way right. nobody actually cares how long mice live or how long C. elegans lives. Right. Ex that's exactly right. Yep. And and I would also say it's ridiculous to think we're going to learn nothing about the yep. biology of aging in humans from studying companion animals. But yes, even if we say that, there's still value in, in doing these kinds of studies and improving the quality and quantity of life for, for pets. So I've been involved, as you know, for a while now with a project called the Dog Aging Project, which Daniel Promislow, Kate Creevy, and myself um, started, depending on how you want to do the math, somewhere between seven and 12 years ago, um, with the idea, you know, sort of around what, what we've already discussed, that there's a good rationale for companion dogs, pet dogs in particular, as a model for the biology of aging, but also to be able to assess rapamycin specifically for its impact on lifespan and health span metrics, because we can actually design a clinical trial. And this is a real clinical trial, double blind, randomized, placebo controlled veterinary clinical trial to answer the question, does rapamycin slow aging, increase lifespan, improve multiple health span metrics in a reasonable time frame. So we set out to design such a clinical trial. We call it the test of rapamycin in aging dogs. We've done two shorter term pilot trials, also double blind placebo controlled to establish safety, to kind of work out dosing, um, and then started the larger clinical trial triad a few years ago, um, which unfortunately coincided with the beginning of COVID-19. So that was challenging, but we continued to work through that and are making progress. And so this is a trial that will ultimately enroll 580 dogs, half get placebo, half get rapamycin. The treatment period is three years. Um, we're looking at multiple measures of health span, including cardiac function, neurological function, activity, cognitive function, there's a few others. But I think most importantly, lifespan is the primary endpoint. So with that cohort size, that uh, length of treatment, we are powered to detect a 9% change in lifespan, which is in towards that, the sorry, lower Matt, end. Is that remaining lifespan or total lifespan? That's total lifespan. Okay. So life expectancy, it's a, it's a bigger number for remaining life expectancy. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so and the reason why we, the reason why we settled on that 9%, as you know, Peter, because you were instrumental in getting us to that point by helping to line up a, a group of donors who, who increased the size of the study. The reason why we aligned on that percentage is because that's towards the lower end of what's been reported in mice. And that's in fact, what was seen in that 2009 study we talked about earlier, starting treatment in middle age in mice. So again, it's a big question. It's unanswered. Even if rapamycin extends lifespan in dogs and in people, will the magnitude of effect translate? That's a different question we don't know the answer to, but it makes sense to start in the right ballpark in terms of what we think might be a reasonable thing to expect for longevity. So that's why we went with that um, uh, cohort size. A couple of other things that are maybe worth just mentioning is that the dogs have to be at least seven years old at the time of randomization. 
and they can't be sick. They can't have any significant pre-existing age-related disease. And, and that's important because the vast majority of clinical trials that are done today, whether it's in companion animals or people, are disease-specific clinical trials in patients who already have a pre-existing disorder. This is a study of normative aging, and so we felt it was important to start with a population that was at least age appropriate in terms of health status. And so, so that's that's the study. Um, dogs are still active. Any being size enrolled. limitations, we, we, Matt? Yeah, sorry. So the dogs have to be between 40 and 110 pounds. And that's for the simple reason that big dogs age faster than small dogs. So again, in order to get the statistical power that we needed, we are working in a population of dogs that are more rapidly aging than a smaller weight body size population. One quick thing, you know, you always ask me if I take rapamycin and, I, and, and my friends ask me whether they should take rapamycin because they know you and that you take rapamycin. And I always say, well, when Matt Caberlin's uh, dog study reads out. If it's positive, I'll take rapamycin. <laughs> so it's funny you say that, David. I say that to a lot of our patients as well. I say, look, I again, I have a relatively strong conviction. It's modestly held. Um, it will be a lot more of a strong conviction one way or the other, and I'll tighten my grip on it in 2026, which is about the time when when we'll have the readout of this study. So yeah, I think yeah, a lot of right. people, Matt, are looking to this study. Um, potentially along with the work of Adam Solomon, maybe we can just touch on that really, really briefly as well as another model. Sure. Let me, let me make a comment on that though, um, which is that I'm not sure that lifespan, so even though we're powered for lifespan, that's our primary endpoint. I'm honestly not sure that's the most important endpoint for evaluating potential efficacy of rapamycin in, in dogs or people, right? I mean, I think we want to think about this more broadly speaking, in the sense that there may be some health span metrics that are particularly and potently positively impacted by rapamycin. I think rapamycin people just also want to make sure there's no people. negative lifespan, though. That's the thing, too. Oh, right? absolutely. It's, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. Like, and again, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I would be shocked. I mean, again, we'll have, we'll wait till the study's done. I would be shocked if we see a shortening of lifespan from rapamycin treatment. Just given everything that I know to this point in mice and the data we've gotten so far in dogs, it is possible, and I totally understand that uh, that that reasoning. It would surprise the heck out of me if we see any lifespan shortening. Not to say that there aren't side effects from rapamycin, yeah, yeah. but I don't think there's any reason to believe that. It's no, I think have it's just hey, are we seeing? We're, yeah, we're not seeing lifespan get yeah. shorter. We're not seeing an uptick in cancer or something that yeah. was unanticipated. Yeah. So, so yeah, if you're neutral to positive on lifespan with these health span benefits in terms of ejection fraction, uh, you right. know, periodontal disease, things like that, that would probably be sufficient enough reason. Mm -hmm.